Thank you all for coming. This is gonna be a really brief conversation. Uh, so Jeannie and I are gonna primarily focus on just two pieces in the show, but I thought I might, since I'm in the space um, and we're hoping to entice some folks who have not been in the space to come see everything in person, I thought I would just kind of swing my, my computer around for a moment so that uh, you can see uh, what it looks like and what we'll be talking about. So we'll primarily be talking about, uh, let's see, this piece right here, which is called Chris and Jane's Gate, which we're gonna be sharing on slides um, and that will make it easier to view. And then a really large uh, projection of a dance film, as well as a small projection of a dance film. Um, so yeah, that was awkward. We'll get started. Uh, Jeannie and I have had like a really excellent time talking to each other. Um, and it's been, for me, it's been kind of like formative. It, it's, I haven't thought about her just kind of describing my work, but I've thought about our conversation as um, being part of the creative process for me and giving me language to figure out what I'm doing, um, which is kind of like akin to my relationship with the dance artists that I work with. Um, so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and uh, we'll get started. Let's see. I'll share the sound. We will share a few minutes, a couple of minutes of the, the video um, for those of you who have not been in the space yet. Oh, sorry. Let's see. Um, okay. So uh, this is just kind of like an installation view of the full show. Um, and uh, yeah, this here is a video piece entitled This Here, Us Now, all caps. And I think we'll start with this piece here, which is um, the piece that Jeannie chose to speak about or to ask me questions about. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, Magda. Um, yes, I too have really gotten a lot out of our conversations. Um, and I feel like uh, in your practice, you're able to do things um, that I'm not able to do, but I'm so happy to kind of live vicariously through you. And um, one of the through lines I'd like to highlight uh, during our conversation is uh, you, your work in this exhibition encompasses so many different methods of making, so many different um, crafts um, that you have even gained sort of professional experience with in your career. So um, I am alluding to uh, upholstery, costume design, um, even sort of this heavy construction um, and choreography. And these are all modes of making. And so what I wanna talk about is how your authorial choices invite interventions from your immediate environment, how you're open to the circumstances of your environment. Um, and how you receive the present um, in these works. And so, um, so yeah, so I, I wanted to talk about this piece, Chris and Jane's Gate, um, because I feel like it kind of, for me, it, it's a kind of a clear illustration of this. So could you tell me how you found, so part of this is a found object. Um, so would you tell me how that came about? Um. I mean, I like the way that you phrased it, inviting kind of like everything that's present. Um, so this is just our neighbor's gate. Um, and most of like the work in the show is uh, kind of like from the homestead, <laughs> like just from where we've been, you know, I have, I've had a kid a year ago. Um, so everything, most of the materials were just kind of lying around. And this is our neighbor's gate, um, which they, didn't hesitate to part with when I suggested it to them. Um, it was just one of those, you know, I was just sticking my kids in the car to take my son to preschool. And I like somehow this hadn't entered my consciousness before. And I thought, you know, I want that. <laughs> so I texted them and said, can I have your gate? We'll replace it. Um, and yeah, that's how this came to be. <laughs> so specifically, I would like to know how the piece of wood became lodged in the gate or that that was part of how you found it. That was the sort of 
um, the event of this piece was that, you know, it was a gate that had um, existed in a place where it was penetrated by this piece of tree. Um, and then another it's interesting that you think of it as the gate penetrating or the tree penetrating the gate, which I guess is true. But yeah. I feel like the gate, the gate is somehow <laughs> a the wrong in the way. Yeah. yeah, it's like somehow the offensive party. Um, yeah. But yeah, this is like a paper mulberry tree, which is basically a weed. It's a really soft tree that grows really quickly that just grew right through this gate, which is something I've, I think we've all seen and maybe have all been delighted by. I know that I find it delightful when I see chunks of trees growing into gates um, and it just happens to stand on its own um, as a little tripod and yeah. So I covered it um, with this green fabric, which was like, very labor intensive every like the whole all the chain link is covered with strips of of bias tape basically which you iron and then sew on by hand yeah um so yeah i feel like there's so there's the found element and i was also very curious just specifically and maybe i'm just um uh, fixating on something did you cut the wood yourself or was it already cut Nope, it was already cut. Oh, so that's wonderful. It's all pretty oh, much as is. So there was a tree that was um, taken down, a paper mulberry. Sorry, let me find these. Um, yeah, and uh, the whole tree was just kind of sitting in their yard in front of this gate. Um, and that's this piece, let's see, right here in the background. Sorry that we have to scroll through all these. <laughs> you guys are getting to see the whole show in this slideshow. Um, this piece in the background here, sorry. This, <laughs> this is the rest of it, um, which also made its way into the show as an installation of just kind of like dissected mm -hmm. tree parts. Yeah, and um, so yeah, so in, so if we could go all the way back to Chris and Jane. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that I really like that there's something in your process of choosing such a saturated color and choosing this material that for you is almost um you know a second language uh this uh because you're you have so much experience sewing that it's to hand that it feels like you've put your signature on this piece um maybe that's a terrible way to say it but you've you've added your touch um in a way that shows that you've given your attention to all of the parts in which your sewing is involved, especially because it's hand sewn along the chain link. Um, and so I feel your attention in each of those moments. And so you've talked in your thesis about labor and the kind of the way that your labor and your time is recorded in your pieces. And so this one actually has both um, machine sewing and hand sewing. Um, yeah. It's the machine yeah. sewing, yeah. And so you have talked about, you know, making something that is found in the world and turning it in, like bringing it into a context where it is considered in a different way. Um, yeah, I mean, I thought, I, I just think that anytime, I, you mentioned this earlier, thinking of this in terms of like photography, yeah. um, just kind of like how you bring attention to something. Um, and yeah, I, I, I've, I've written about this in terms of kind of like family photos, you know, like how I could look at photos of my mom and, and her grandma from the 60s forever and, and be interested, but you would not be interested. So the question for me with an object like this is just like, how do I communicate the way it seduces me um, to people I don't know? And I think part of how I did that here or tried to do that was just by the ten through the attention that you're talking about, like through the labor that you're talking about, so that there's a way that the amount of time that's visible in the work is kind of focuses your attention on this object in a way that it might not be focused otherwise. Um, yeah, uh, something else that I thank you, something <laughs> else that I noticed about the photography of this work. Um, if you could go back to the image where you see it in front of this hear us now yes so, yes, yes or, one. um or in front of the mulberry um yeah so the the shadow is very striking and it occurred to me that 
I hadn't seen it this way before and that perhaps the shadow was part of the installation. Um, so how considered is that in part of your, in your? Um, the shadow is not, was not specifically part of the installation, but um, because we're showing this large video work um, in this space, uh, that just affected all of the lighting decisions since this is not a darkened space. Um, so ultimately, I think the lighting decisions really worked for me because they produce this like very theatrical space, which makes sense to me like as a dancer and a choreographer. And in relation to this uh, piece being on the wall, uh, we also, if you look in the corner here, um, I exhibited, I'm exhibiting all of the costumes from the video work that's on display. So uh, while the decision to like cast shadows was not kind of like pre, it's not something I decided on before, I think there's like, it creates a through, like a through line between some of the sculptural works and the video work. Yeah. Um, it kind of gives it like a back, like I have the sense of being like in a theater or in a, you know, like performance environment when I'm in here. Yeah, you're talking about like theatrical spotlighting or mm -hmm. yeah, that would create a shadow of that kind. Um, yeah. Should we yeah. move on to the video? Yes. We're almost out of time. Yes, we are. <laughs> Um, okay, so yeah, I was going to wait for you to cue it up, but um, yeah, so the video is this here, Us Now, and mm -hmm. um, so you have a background in dancing as a dancer, and, yeah. um, and so uh, you're very attuned to how bodies work, and a lot of your sculptural work also speaks to um, the kind of self-recognition we have with sculptural objects that are not uh, even anthropomorphic per se. Um, uh, but here you are treating human bodies essentially um, as sculptural forms to the point where you've even created the costumes um, that morph these figures' uh, bodies into a different shared shape among three people. So, um, so yes, so thank you. My first um, question is, uh, what is your relationship with the dancers? Um, as um, people? So uh, we'll show a little clip here in a second, but this here <laughs> is Kelsey Oliver, and this is Alexa Caparetta, and this is Michael J. Love, and, and the two women I've worked with many times. Um, so we have like a really like wonderful rapport, and I credit them credited them all as co-choreographers in this process. Um, Kelsey was actually my student as an undergrad here at UT. Uh, I was her ballet teacher. Um, and then Michael, this is the first time Michael and I have worked together and he is a tap dancer, which was both like extremely exciting and somewhat terrifying because it's a form that I don't actually have any expertise in. Um, so I wasn't entirely sure how to fold it into this work that we were making. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment and just share um, a few moments, oh, sorry, a few moments of the video with you guys, for those of you that have not seen it. Um, hold on one second, guys. And here we go. So, yeah. Let's make this big. So we shot this outdoors um, and it's basically just a series of, of vignettes uh, where we kind of like explored what you described, Jeannie, which is the kind of possibilities and limitations of this costume that, they, uh, that I put them inside of. Um, so yeah, we'll just watch this for a moment. It's Alexa. So I think I'll just uh, reshare reshare this with um, without sound, and we'll just let it play while we're talking to one another. 
if that seems like a good idea. Um, I love this clip that you're showing, uh, the one just before, the shot right before this, um, where Alexa is attempting a pointed toe. Um, uh, extension to the side. Extension to the side. Oh, yeah, let's go. So, um, it's been a while since I've been hip to the lingo. So yeah, so the, it's like Michael has chosen to almost detect the perfection of that form uh, auditor like like a Geiger counter with his clicking um, so that his clicks get closer together as she gets closer and closer to the proper form. Um, yeah. and That's so, a beautiful word choice, I think. Geiger yeah. counter. Yeah. Well, I the Geiger that. counter also kind of goes with this like retro aesthetic that you have going on. <laughs> um, but I wanted to talk about how that was actually his choice, that you didn't um, direct that, that that wasn't and that that's again this kind of opening to your circumstances or to your social circumstances too. Yeah, I mean, we called this this here us now because it was kind of like I had to make a decision about being open to kind of all of the circumstances, um, just because of how kind of limited my time to make work is because of having kids. Um, and so yeah, Michael improvised everything within certain parameters. Um, and like I said, I don't know anything. I don't know the first thing about tap dancing. And so I had to speak to him in this really crude way where I'd say, can you do like a, like a little kind of like mini tapping thing where you just, you know, like I spoke to him like that essentially. Um, and it was just one of those like lovely interactions where then he would do something that I couldn't imagine, couldn't have imagined. And I would say, yes, like that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> that's perfect. Keep that. Um, and that's kind of how the process worked. And that's how the process works with Alexa and Kelsey and I too, where I say, I'm imagining you kind of like bent over doing this little thing with your feet. And we produce uh, the movement together, like from little images like that. Yeah, I love, I love the give and take because as dancers, they have to be open to your uh, suggestions and even the way you've encumbered their bodies and their movements with uh, your costume and these props that they're holding. Um, but you are also open to them. You, uh, that, that's part of it. Like the imperfections are part of it and their ideas are also part of it. Um, yeah. I feel like now we should open up to questions. I think you're right. Okay. Um, if there are any questions, feel free, y'all, if you have a question, to just unmute yourselves. We can't see that many folks. Um, so, yeah, and if not, we'll just keep talking. <laughs> um, can't see the chat either. Here. I can. If someone is speaking, feel free to speak. I, I have a question, Magda. Um, yeah. Could you Thank talk you. about the relationship to play? It's a really <laughs> wonderful question. Um, gosh, yeah. I think play, I hadn't really thought about that word, but I think that's such a lovely word um, because it's, it's, about, um, it, it's, it's about things being open-ended um, and not like predetermined um and so yeah i mean i think that our process especially with this was very playful like you could just, like you could see me just now moving the the plywood in front of michael's feet so that he could continue tapping um and that was initially kind of like a, a problem like how are we going to solve this problem of michael having something to tap on um and then we just kind of included that in the yeah i think the relationship to play just has to do with like being available to kind of um you know what's there what's happening um and delight is just like a is a really important element for me in work uh like i i i want to be delighted and i want to delight others so i think that's that's uh a relationship to play as well just a thank sense you. of delight yeah thank you that's a beautiful question I think we probably have time for like one more question if anybody else has one. I wish you guys could hear this, but. It's not a question, but I think it's interesting choice of a, of a landscape for what you do here. 
that has that offers the, a little bit of a road mm -hmm. and also the and the water i don't know if that's the river which which um, suggests a nice correlation with the way the dress is designed that bridges those figures uh, uh, and and almost everything is in a is flexible here it can be repositioned not to say that the the plywoods or whatever it is it is it is another way to to speak about uh, the aspect of uh, uh, of allowing the movement to take place at least for some of them so yeah that's lovely i hadn't thought about like the connection between the creek that's the, the pernellus down there um and this piece of fabric here but yeah the we ended up shooting kind of from the top of this piece of land, moving downwards towards the river. And then that's the way the video was assembled ultimately. And um, this, the choice to shoot outdoors actually came from a critique where Austin Swearingen said, well, what if you shot in a field where the only way Michael's shoes could make noise is if there were pieces of plywood involved. And so that made the plywood necessary in this way that I found as, as soon as he said that, I was like, okay, there's, this is how we're going to do it. So. And the choice of drop, drone shot is fantastic. I think it's a very good, very good addition to, to other angles. Yeah, we had a, there's an excellent, I have a friend who's an excellent video production person who shot this for us. So, um, but I do think we're going to have to end there. Um, thank you everybody for bearing with us and for listening. Thank you, Jeannie, so much. Thank you, Magda. For, for everything. I wish we could have talked about color, but. I know, I wish we could have talked about a lot more, but um, so I am going to now pass this conversation on to Anya and Amelia and Eduardo, who are just in the next room here, um, and we'll continue on with uh, her work. Thank you, guys. Hi. Um, so, um, hi, I'm Maria Emilia Fernandez. I'm a first year MA student here at the Art History Program. Um, and I, I was introduced to Anya by Professor Michael Smith uh, in, the, in the art department, who knew us both and thought we might get along. Um, and so she reached out in an email, introducing herself. Uh, and I'm quoting here as a second year MFA grad student working in photography, sculpture, and film, thinking a lot about the changing relationship of North Americans with nature from howling wilderness to subjugation and salvage paradigm. Um, so I was interested. Um, so um, I thought I would present you, Anya, in the same way that you introduced uh, yourself to me. Um, and just mentioned that ever since we met, um, Ours has been not so much um, a series of meetings, but rather one long, ongoing conversation through which I feel like I've maybe gotten a glimpse uh, of your artistic process. Uh, we also have Eduardo Vesi, uh, Vesi joining us uh, for this talk. He is a Mexico-based composer and sound designer uh, with whom Anya has collaborated in two of the videos we see in the exhibition. Uh, so I'm very excited that we'll get to hear more about that aspect of your work. Um, so I think I'll, I'll pass the word um, on to you, Anya, and I think we'll watch an extract from one of your works. Thank you so much, Maria Emilia. Um, I'm going to show um, a video, um, one of the two that I'm showing in the gallery. It's titled Excess of Description, and um, hopefully, um, and so it's a collaboration between me and Eduardo, um, sound, image, and text. Um, share my screen. Do you have another story to tell, real or imagined? The contemplation of nature alone is not sufficient to fill my heart and mind. I want to start with a pile of bones, then turn them into a horse somehow if I can. In my pursuit to annihilate space and time, I will survey, build, and expand. 
I will strive for coherence, accuracy, and completeness. I will pull a trigger, and a photosensitive plate will be impressed with a picture of a headless creature, still standing, before its body had time to fall. I will dream of journeys repeatedly, of entradas, of expeditions, of crossings. The root of the word magic means to be able to have power. A magician told me that images share the power with mages, plus the intrusion of eye. And I, the cartographer of all, softens the focus and renders the past toothless. But if I knew it was harmless, I would have killed it myself. He tells me the railroad settled the native question, that all that is left are images speeding by in the darkness. All that was solid dissolved into air. From East Terminus in Omaha to Palduro, where the horse turns into bone, into wheat, into image, the railroads carry me home to the west. But its missions are surrounded by mass graves, its ships and military corvettes, and its rivers bleed mercury and gold. I am speechless and blind in its labyrinths and libraries. I lend my imperfect tears to the whisper of the rattlesnake grass and the elms, to the cooper's hall coal, to the voices of earlier and other creation the sounds of invisible cities on fire. Buffalo grass was told to grow three inches overnight when the hundreds of dead were laid. I lose the sounds of the tracks and the tops of magnolias, date palms, and poplars, the unlikely passengers of trains and ships hiring photographers and wheat to the west. Nature does not stop to lift a damselfly out of the tar, nor does she flick a beetle on its feet. When she is done with me, she cleans her smooth green face like a cat. A house will record and be a record. In San Jose, a house that Sarah Winchester built curls itself into a maze into a scroll devouring stories of many hungry ghosts of those who didn't win the West. As she looked through San Jose Mercury, leisurely noting Moobridge's photograph of lava beds, the last stand of Mata Kaur. As she read the news of Ishi, stumbling into a yard of Orville's slaughterhouse from the foothills of Mount Lassen. looks over the ocean beach whispering, Hansi Saltu, so many ghosts. She knew and her house became a memory of knowing. I walk through it holding on to the shadows of the cherry trees dancing on its living room walls while Diablo blows from the east, to the calls of Kenny and Tuhis hiding in the grass around it. Sarah's ghosts are no more, but if you put your ear to the ground, you can trust there's something humming underneath. Olin buys Winchester and becomes the largest small ammunition supplier of the US military. A 100 round of Winchester active duty goes for $27.99 at Brownells, and first time buyers and new shooters Enter the house of Sarah with me, and never leave.
Thank you for watching it with us. No, thank you for, for sharing that. And I think it'll it'll give a good background for anyone who hasn't yet seen uh, the exhibition uh, or your work. Um, so I wanted to start um, by going back to one of our recent talks in which we were discussing the relationship of words and images. And you mentioned the double-edged sword of language and the danger in the danger, yeah, in both in trying to pin down meaning through symbols. And you said something that I have actually noted down as the, how poetic language does not name things; it merely hints at them. Um, and that conversation got me thinking of the way that uh, French philosopher and art historian uh, Georges Didi Huberman uh, conceives of how images are capable of touching the real, and in uh, in their contact with the real, they offer us um, the truth of that reality, its memory. He writes, um, and this is a quote from him, uh, that one cannot speak of the contact between the image and the real without speaking of a kind of fire. Therefore, one cannot talk about images without talking about ashes, vestiges, or ghosts. Um, end quote. Uh, so I just thought that, that those words really spoke to me in relation to your work. So I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about your process in putting together words and images in your work. and. Uh, the way in which you approach uh, the real, and in that process, develop a poetic form of language. Maria, um, this reminds me of a of a story of meeting Hopi um, Native American people, meeting mis missionary, um, Western missionaries for the first time, and after missionaries introducing them to the story of. Um, Old and New Testament, um, Hopi in turn shared the story of the of their creation myth, um, the creation of corn, and the missionaries were offended and said, "Well, we presented you with the truth, um, and you're showing us something that was not truthful." And that concept was really surprising to Hopi people because they were they said that we are not seeking the truth, we're seeking meaning. And so I think um, words have a long history of being used to seek truth rather than meaning. And I think poetic language really tries to escape from, from that tradition and tendency. And I'm so incredibly interested in working with language because there's no other connection between humans that I know about, we, we can feel each other's presence physically when we're in one space and we're together. But um, I think Mikhail Bakhtin put it very succinctly and when we gaze at each other, um, there are two different people reflecting in the pupils of our eyes. And so I think we really need each other and each other's unique perspectives to, to build a more full image of the world. And I think myself included, um, I think we often fail to listen to other people, um, but there's beauty and, and and there's a need to build one's horizon with what other people see because ne they never see the same way. And that's why you know, I, I work a lot with intertextuality. Um, I never think about these texts as, as my own because lots of it is something I've heard from people, something I have um, read in some public domain, like literally written in the wall. Um, another piece starts with, um, imagine crashing a shell with a microscope to find out how beautiful it is. And that was coined during the, trying to explain what I'm working on and what I'm trying to do in college to a person in my native tongue who's not in the arts. Right, and just I wonder if you could speak to us a little bit more about, uh, like actually the 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 working process, whether it's uh, you come up with the images first or the text, or if they kind of go back and forth. Just uh, yeah. I, I work extensively on researching and trying to put together something that um, that helps me create meaning from experience of, of being in the land. It's a good deal of work that I've done is, is about placing myself in the West and what kind of um, debt I own to this place for making home here. Um, and it's always takes 
collaboration with natural forces <clears throat> to make the, the image happen. So the image that you have seen is from, um, from around Paladura Canyon. It's a turning point for, um, of, um, of Texas native wars where General McKenzie troops have slaughtered uh, over 2,000 of Kiowa, um, Cheyenne, and um, Arapaho horses. So I went there um, without camera, without a plan, and a snowstorm happened on, on the, the next day I arrived. So I felt like for me, it is always collaboration with something larger than myself, um, rather than engineering um, a plan. Thank you for that. And I think this is uh, a good way to go into another question that I had. Um, so in looking at your work, um, I find it uh, to be a composite of many voices, including your own. So I wanted to ask you about this aspect, the, the, um, the aspect of collaboration, which informs your practice and uh, really to, to also hear from Eduardo, uh, who you've worked in uh, two videos, uh, the two videos that uh, are in view at the VAC, Westward Ho and Excellence in Description. Um, yeah, just if you could share some, some of those insights into that process and how you think uh, the conversation that you've had um, kind of unfolds in these works. Is that going to be from me, I guess? Okay, I'll start. Um, yeah, well, I met, I met Anya in, uh, like, well, we didn't actually meet. We just kind of, like, found each other in a workshop of Sundance, like a Sundance workshop, online thing, quarantine situation, and you know, like a bunch of people in a Zoom meeting. And then we shared our portfolios in this long list and Anya's work is just, you know, kind of like catches your eye and avoidably it's just very unique. And it's exactly like the kind of tone or uh, at atmosphere that I, I identify a lot with. Because I just wanted to add, in regard to the last question, that Anya's pieces, the ones I've experienced, are just so intensely charged with, I guess I would call it meaning or, uh, or some sort of history because of all of the artifacts she collects uh, through her experiences trying to collect, uh, yeah, material to generate a piece. And every single bit of those things is just very heavily charged, like these pictures uh, that are in the exhibition of a donkey being exploded by just kind of like as an exercise for the camera's speed to capture light and image. And it's just a heavy, oh, like a raw, heavy uh, element. It's just so charged with all sorts of energies that, uh, just kind of like adding to that last question, like I think her language is just a bunch of all these collections and kind of like reacting to them. And, you know, in collaboration with those objects that are so charged, she generates this new discourse. Um, anyway, that was like way off topic to this actual question. Uh, I don't, the process, we were talking about that the other day and I'm not actually sh sure, cause it's like, a, it's like an in-between thing, I would say. Because she, she's got, I mean, in these past experiences, she has a text that she's working on. It's not a finished text. And, and she shares it with me. She, she reads it to me. It's not a recording. She like reads it and, you know, interprets it. And yeah, we're just looking at these elements and like all these poetic lines and kind of like reacting to them in the moment, brainstorming a bit. In, and how to uh, portray them without being like a pantomime of like horse, 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 horse sounds, uh, glass, 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 glass things, but like more of a in-between thing. Uh, and I think that would be in a way how the collaboration happens. It's not one person guiding the other, but it's more of a throwing something to the other person and the other person does it at the same time. And then it just clashes in the middle and falls and psh, makes a big stain. And that's what we achieved. <laughs> I guess, what would you say, Annie? I, I, I'll add that, you know, there's this, English is, is not my first language. And so I always feel like, and, you know, talking about music, which is something I am, um, you know, it, it, 
it's another language, right? So I always feel that we come up with common definition of what does it even mean sad? Uh, what does it mean particular tone that we want to achieve? And so that comes through again through explanation through language through showing each other um, chords or particular sounds and that has that has influenced uh, my thinking about images and how um, just how wealthy our vocabulary our internal vocabularies are and how much it takes to to, to translate it to another person. And then, of course, it becomes easy as, as we got to know each other. But um, um, I never taught, I, never, I guess, I never take for granted um, that we all have the same definition of language. I would say this experience with you particularly is a very unique experience for me because usually when, you, when, when I collaborate with someone, we yeah, like we get together in person and we kind of have a coffee or something and like get to, get to know each other a bit and, and and just kind of like understand each other just a bit in a, in a meeting in person. And because of like the circumstances, we haven't even actually managed to meet in person. It's all been emails and, and Zoom calls, which I hate, but you know, it's what we have. Not because of you, I just hate ah, the Zoom thing. It's not great anyway. Uh, but hopefully but yes, soon. Like, hopefully soon, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's been a, this, this particular one's just been all online and all like at distance, and that's how we we've had to construct this this vocabulary for us to communicate. You know, like what you were saying that as as two individuals, we each have a. Uh, an understanding of, of words, of uh, emotions, of what they mean, sadness, what does that mean? It, it will mean something very different to me than it means to someone else. Uh, so, so when we talk about these, since we don't have that technical shared language of musical theory in your case and like art theory or kind of like in my case or video theory, uh, we have to use these common words that that are very interpretable. And that's where kind of like we have to build a new vocabulary that's only going to work for, for you and me. It's like our own vocabulary of definitions of emotions of, and of these kind of like keywords that we build through references of, well, this is what I mean by sad, like listen to this song and that sadness. And you're like, oh, look at that. Maybe that wasn't that sad for you. And then you share and we can like start understanding each other. So yeah, like building a, a new vocabulary with, with 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 you is would be like I guess the process. Yeah, and I guess to say that that then becomes something that needs also to be translated or coherent for um, for everyone who was not inside that conversation, which I think is really um, what you guys have have managed to do in these two videos. Um, so I think we're we're actually out of time. Um, would love to continue the conversation, uh, but I think it's time for us to introduce our next speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, and I want to pass the word to um, uh, Heather Canterbury and um, um, Tracy Min. Hi. Thank you, Hi. Anya. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Heather. Thank you so much for being <laughs> here today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I think this is a wonderful thing that's happening. So um, I guess let me just start by um, talking a little bit about how we met and how this process has been. For us, it's been um, very similar, a lot of Zoom um, conversations. And I've joined into the critiques to hear um, feedbacks from other people as well about Heather's work. Um, and I think there is a very central um, theme in your work that there is a very poignant story almost of how this whole thing kind of came together by chance. And I was wondering if Heather, you would like to start um, your presentation and sharing about your, your, your work um, in that way, telling the story. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I am going to share a PowerPoint quickly. Let's see. Oh, 
Okay. Um, so I do invite chance into my process and my work quite a bit. And I will say that initially coming to Texas, I had a lot of difficulty um, taking images. I do work solely with photography. And so I was bringing along like my past process of working um, here to Texas. And that was a bit of a struggle for me. Um, I did end up working with some of my personal journals that I do have up. Um, I use two of my own journals in my work. And um, also, I ended up, um, I think that that's kind of like a, a big focus of my work is just writing and journaling. And had I not ended up working with my own personal journal journals, I don't think that um, the larger scale work that you see here would have even taken place. Um, I know you and I have talked about how I found the journals and how they came about and um, sharing that has been a part of this process for me. Um, I actually, um, in January of this year, um, a tree fell next to my apartment. And for some reason, I just felt like it was really important to document um, this tree. And so I called um, to have the tree removed. And that ended up being just like um, a process for me. I journaled about watching them remove the tree. It was a, a very slow process watching them remove all of the limbs of this tree and then also um, putting it through the mulch, the mulcher. And um, I was quite inquisitive with the, the gentlemen that removed, were, were removing the tree. So I actually learned quite a bit in that process as well. Um, but a couple of days later in the same area that the tree had fallen, I ended up finding three bags of, um, of stuff, um, items. And this could be such a long story, but to shorten it, um, I, will, I will say that I ended up finding um, five journals within um, these three bags. Um, and so, yeah, I became obsessed, quite obsessed with these journals um, they were very different than my own personal journals which you and I have talked about quite a bit definitely yeah um I'm especially moved by um it seems so long it seems so short this body of work because of um the installation of it and also the inclusion of the front and the back cover of this fund journal um at the beginning and the end of this grid um, that you have created, um, a space for people to walk into to kind of, um, you know, take a pick um, of what's happening in this person's life a couple decades ago. Um, and it's such a beautiful way to kind of take a fragment of somebody's life and pose the question of how do we cherish that and how do we um, deal with that? How do we situate ourselves in a scenario like this one. So um, with that being said, I would also like to ask you a question, um, you know, to, to in terms of talking about um, your kind of idea of the exterior um, versus the interior, both in the physical sense of the front and the back cover of this journal um, and the interior of the journal, but also um, the, the exterior world that we physically live in, but also, um, you know, in relation to the interior world, which is our mind. And this also kind of reflects in your other two works that um, deals with the issue of interior and exterior differently. So um, would you like to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, so a lot of my, my work, um, these installations of grids, 
do um, pose this this um, internal external um, which I've specifically focused on in terms of perspective not only with perspective of you know the camera and um, perspective in terms of you know photography and depth of field and um, but yeah I I definitely think that I not only in this the work with my own personal journals and placing the journals within a background and then re-photographing them um, I really did want to create you know an an internal perspective for the viewer um, because you know writing for me is is such a personal place um, and I do think that there is quite a bit of um, risk involved in, in sharing your own personal journals but then you know it also felt quite risky for me to go through someone else's journal you know um, almost like you know jumping into someone else's um, internal state of mind. So um, I did choose for um, this, these two, a drop in the landscape, these two grids um, that I've kind of created on the wall with this um, repeating background. Um, I do, there is a lot of writing and I, I think that it is somewhat overwhelming to come in and see all of this, uh, all of this writing. Um, so I'm, I'm almost like inviting people into these internal personal worlds. Um, and I think, you know, to focus more on your question of just like perspective and the internal versus external, I do find myself quite often relating um, my internal to like the external being like the landscape. So like my internal landscape um, to the external landscape. And I'm sure we've all had that experience of when it's raining outside and you're feeling bad, it's almost like the world is giving you somewhat of a um, encouragement to, it's like, it's okay to feel bad today, you know? So I do, I do find myself often just like finding ways to relate to the, to the cycles of, um, of climate or um, different things that are going on, you know, with nature and these cycles of life um, that have become quite comforting for me. Definitely. I think that there is a notion of exploring the possibility of finding a coherence between the internal and the external. Um, and I would like to kind of circle back to the idea of chance um, because um, in this work um, and also in another work that's also called A Drop in the Landscape, um, Twilight, right? Um, in those two works, you have included um, those falling pages from the journal, which are blank. And also in the photography, the journal always starts with a lot of motivation, intention, energy, but somewhat, somehow, it just ends up um, being abandoned. So I kind of wanted to invite you to maybe share a little bit more um, about the idea of the falling and the surrender in your work. Yeah, the, the one thing that I became so aware of when I started dissecting my own journals was the fact that I would start these journals with such great intentions, you know, this idea of changing myself and my behaviors. And um, the two journals do document my experience through and, you know, my own personal struggles and um, in kind of like opening this up um, and allowing others to, I don't want to say like share in this experience, but, you know, sharing my experience, like allowing other people um, to be aware of that kind of introduces this idea of, um, of hope for me. Um, 
I've, I feel like I've, I've gained so much strength and support from other people sharing their stories. So I've, you know, chosen to do this myself, which is again, quite risky. Um, but one thing that I noticed in, in the journals was that I would start off with such great intentions. As you can see, I think I started um, this particular journal and I only got to day 20. And my goal in starting um, this journal was to, was to quit drinking. Um, and I successfully made it to day 20 and um, didn't drink for 20 days. And then I think the last, the last day that I wrote was that I was bored. And, um, you know, these dates back um, over five years. And so going back through them was um, difficult for me. But I noticed one thing that I noticed was all the blank pages, you know, so that they ended up becoming more symbolic to me than, than the writing. Um, and so I, I really wanted to focus on that and this this idea of a drop as you speak of and this idea of falling um i think universally we we can all relate to to some type of struggle and you and i have talked extensively about about that and um you know it it's for me i don't i don't want the sole focus to be on my struggle but more or less on you know, the fact that we all do struggle in trying to change things in our life and struggle in trying to make, um, make changes. And it's a difficult, difficult thing to do. Um, the drop for me of all of the, all of the um, pages on the floor ended up being, you know, somewhat of like a failure, but also symbolic of my, um, later surrender to this whole process and kind of finding my way um, outside of the journal. For sure. I think that your work, uh, especially those two where the pages are falling on the floor physically in the space of exhibition, invites the viewer to kind of, you know, find a relatable because it is in their space. Um, my next question is about um, fragmentation, is about finding ways to preserve those beautiful moments that you've encountered and how short and how you know, um, impermanent it is, but how can we find a way um, or how can you find a way to kind of preserve that fragment of time, of moment um, in your work and communicate it and share it with your viewer? Um, so yeah, you wanna talk about that part of your work? Yeah, um, so I think we have a couple of more minutes and I'm happy to, to end with that. I think that's a great question. Um, you know, I do work with the, within the confines of photography and for me, um, that idea of like preserving a moment is, is very important to me. Um, I do have, um, and I'm gonna have to scroll through, but I do have a wall of images and I, I realize that this, this image is kind of dark. So I'll scroll through um, the images on their own, but I did spend quite a bit of time still photographing during the past two years of the program and this idea of like relating myself to the earth and my surroundings and the landscape ended up playing a really large part in my work. Um, I ended up kind of just creating my own visual poem um, of this, you know, the peaks and falls, um, this internal struggle of, um, of extremes per se, you know, my, my initial response is always to go to one extreme or the other. So um, the title of, of this series of work is um, balancing between birth, births and death. Um, and I've, I've joked that, you know, when it comes to me, it either has to be a birth or a death. You know, I really struggle in finding this like gray middle area. 
Um, so yeah, I, I did create this, this poetic visual poem um, of images that I did create over the past two years. And, and for me that, you know, it, it really is kind of preserving my time here. Um, and also, you know, I kind of found my own way to journal through photography since I wasn't quite as successful at, at journaling, but um, photography has, has ended up becoming that for me. Exactly, I think, I think it is your language, right? Um, that's wonderful. Uh, we are out of time. I'm not sure if we still have a uh, space for Q&A for Heather as her work has so much, your work has so much to, to, to yet to be explored and to discuss. So um, yeah, well, thank you so much, Tutsi. And you know, I want to invite Anya and Magda and Maria and Jeannie back on just so we can close. Um, I think that um, that this has been so great, and I really appreciate everyone being here. I know that this has been fun for all of us. So thank you, thank you all for uh, uh, joining us uh, uh, tonight. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Chutsi. It was a very uh, interesting and um, uh, uh, personal but uh, also a thoughtful conversation. Uh, small refusals is on view through May 23rd. We are open Wednesday, Saturday, 12 to 5 p.m. Uh, masks are still required for all staff and visitors, but you do not need an appointment to come uh, visit. So I encourage you very much to visit this uh, very interesting and uh, thoughtful show and uh, um, I wish you all also a nice weekend. Goodbye. Bye y'all. There's Thank also everyone. Thank you.